Ladies and gentlemen, now hosting the Rizzo cast, put your hands together for Steven Risotto. What is happening, everybody, and welcome. This is episode number 114, and apparently there's 114 people that I'd rather have on than my next guest. <laughs> it is uh, a columnist for the Bay Area News Group. Uh, he's been there for a while, and he's also uh, occasionally an on-air host at KMBR 680. It is our pal, Dieter Kurtenbach. Dieter, welcome. How you doing? 113 people, Stephen. Uh, clearly, I, I mean, I can't be shortchanged here. I got 113. I get it. I get 113. 114, we, we'd have some words, but very happy to be on the show. Uh, it has been a long time coming. Glad we can make it happen. Yeah, 100%. And uh, I know you're a busy guy and you're uh, trying to avoid the chaos of your house right now. So <laughs> we, always, I, we always appreciate the time. <laughs> I'm doing this from my car uh, off an iPad using McDonald's Wi-Fi. Uh, I live a very glamorous life. This is what you can look forward to as a newspaper columnist. Uh, now, my house is being torn to absolute shreds. We're doing some renovations on it. And uh, right, <laughs> it was just downstairs and now it's everywhere. Uh, so every day, like a, like a malignant tumor, it spreads and it's really quite terrible. And uh, that's why me and my dog Moose, who might pop up here uh, at some point, are, are hanging out in the car. But uh, hey, we got a nice Diet Coke going, ready to talk some Giants baseball. Yeah, there we go. Did Is the kitchen at least salvaged or is that like become kitchen, a victim too? The kitchen's fine. Uh, we, my wife and I were, were very lucky to own a home in the Bay area. We, we like prefacing everything with that. Like it's, it's a ridiculous champagne problem. Uh, but the owner who had previously, uh, resided in it for 30 years did some, he was a woodworker and he had some incredible stuff in the house. And, uh, he clearly thought that his woodworking prowess just extended to everything prowess. And as we were to do some pretty you know intermediate re renovations we found out it actually was major renovations because basically our house was a giant fire code uh we had no foundation it, it's uh it's been really fun writing these checks Stephen. it's been an absolute blast and uh so yeah the kitchen we're like oh this should be salvageable but guess who's in the kitchen today having to rewire everything because the electricity was basically running off of one plug for years in a house that was built in the 1800s. Uh, no one wants to hear these sob stories. Again, we're very lucky to have it, but uh, this is why I do my meetings in the car now. <laughs> there you go. Maybe that's why you were able to afford the house. <laughs> yeah, I, may, maybe. I mean, uh, now I'm starting to realize why they didn't take the highest bidder. They're like, oh no, this guy's the biggest sucker. He definitely <laughs> will accept this house. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. It's it will all be worth it is what I keep telling myself, and uh, I'm just not sure if that's true. But that's that's my issue, and uh, we got to get to the issues of the San Francisco Giants baseball's eminent 500 baseball team. Yeah, of course, and I definitely want to keep tabs on that. By the way, the uh, the house. Uh, but how much of your attention is actually focused on the Giants right now? Because I know obviously the 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 season has kind of gone haywire it started going haywire yeah. a few months ago and it's it, it, there's been signs of the haywire stopping then there's signs of it mm. coming back so how much of your like focus is actually towards baseball right now i i haven't been riding the roller coaster as of late like it, it 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 just became plainly obvious to me and i think so many other people who maybe just didn't want to admit it at the time that this team was just average and listen there's nothing wrong with that in a vacuum uh, I think that in different years, uh, what this team does, it, it might even be compelling, engaging. But coming off 107, we were primed to believe that this team had taken a step forward. And what's pretty clear is that they really haven't, that the 107 was an aberration. And every day we find out more and more how much of an aberration it was. And that this team is much closer to the uh, the pandemic shortened, you know, sort of 500 team that we saw that they might finish more or less in the same spot in the standings and the uh, more or less the same record with percentages like that's they're closer to that team. And that team had some positive qualities because they had sucked for years and years and years. And then they come through and it's like, Hey, they're kind of 500 and Farhan's working the bottom of the roster. And Hey, you know, Mikey Stremsey's a good player and they're finding stuff. They're making things happen. It seemed like progress and obviously, you know, improvement isn't always linear, but to go back a year, to, to take a clear step back 
the way that they have after 107, no matter how false anyone believed it to be, um, you would want to think that a team that wins 107 that had, yes, the loss of Kevin Gosman, but the addition of a Carlos Rodon who had a bullpen the way that they had a bullpen last year, which did not get a- enough run, in my opinion, in terms of um, uh, publicity and, and conversation. Uh, that was the best bullpen in baseball all season long. And in the second half of the year, at, at moments when you just thought, oh, this could all fall apart, that bullpen stepped up even more. The month of September last year when they win 107, they have three starting pitchers, and they're not doing CC Sabathia with them. They're, they're doing them on the regular rotation. They're doing Johnny Holstaff two out of every five days. And the bullpen just came through again and again and again. And obviously this year that has not been the case. Uh, it's not terribly surprising because we didn't understand how they did it last year bullpens like defenses in the nfl are are typically not sticky um it's a very fickle profession but when you're not hitting home runs the way that they're not hitting home runs when the defense sucks and i know it's been better as of late but their defense still sucks uh when they're doing the platoon thing there's no, no rhythm there's no pace there's no energy there's no personality to this baseball team and outside of the days when you have a good pitching performance most of the time when Carlos Rodon pitches, as we saw yesterday, and, and obviously Logan Webb as well, as we'll see. And it, it, you can get something from Wood. You can get something from Cobb. You can get something from some of these uh, – Junis. Well, what well, you could have gotten something from Junis. You can get something from these guys. You feel like you have a little bit of something, but they just don't put together more than one phase a night. Uh, and that's the opposite of what they did. It, 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 it's just very disappointing and it was pretty clear that just things weren't going to get better. They didn't do anything at the deadline one way or another. Uh, you know, they traded Darren Ruff for JD, uh, what was it? Davis, Davis, JD Davis. Uh, same thing, same thing. They got a couple extra prospects. The frustration that I have with this team, and I think it's shared by a lot of other giants fans is that they're still doing the things that they were doing in the early Farhan years. They're still working the bottom of the roster. They're still trying to win games in the margins. And nobody does it better than Farhan. Roster spots 15, maybe 17, down to 25. I mean, that's the guy you want filling it out. But when you win 107 games and you tell everybody, hey, we're here. We're ready to rumble. Let's do this thing. And they can't backtrack on that now. 107 is unimpeached when you say hey we're here we got to go we're competing we're going to play with two of the the biggest spending teams in baseball we are going to compete for world series we're back to where we want to be and even though we might take a little bit of a step back because 107 is ridiculous like we're a playoff team year in and year out for them to not be that to unequivocally not be that and for them to still be just sort of tinkering at the bottom of the roster to not bring in any big names unless it was a one-for-one replacement uh, you know, a, a 5% marginal increase, maybe, maybe 5% marginal decrease, even if Carlos Rodon has been great, like for it to just be one for one stuff to just sort of say, like, let's run it back uh, to not take that step forward in free agency going into this season to not make a big splash at any point before the trade deadline to just not progress to the point where you are actually playing in the same ballpark as the Padres and especially the Dodgers it's exceptionally disappointing. And then you add in the fact that, you know, so much has been built up since day one of Farhan Zaidi's reign here about the farm system. He's going to rebuild the farm system. That is going to be the bank from which the giants take out all these loans and, and make all these payments. Like that's going to be, that's going to be the big pile of money that they can work from. If it's not actually a big pile of money, which we're finding out it might not actually be, even though this is one of the most uh, uh, lucrative teams in sports, one of the, the highest value teams in sports. But if they're not going to spend big money, at least they'll have that farm system that Farhan has spent a couple of years now building up uh, that they could, you know, deal and deal with guys, or they can come up and, and become big time major league players. And to this point, I would say the farm system, while yes, built up from its state of nothing, is not elite. It's produced one maybe major league player that you can count on on a day-in, day-out basis, and that's Joey Bart, and that feels fleeting because it's all rather new. Uh, you know, Elliot Ramos has almost no trade value. 
I, I used his name a lot when I was talking to people around the trade deadline and they're like, yeah, no one really wants Elliot Ramos. And it's like, well, what the hell are we doing here? Like Elliot Ramos, we, we talked about Elliot Ramos on KMBR night after night after night because that was supposed to be somebody and there was a team that was that was crappy so we had to talk about something so we talked about guys like Elliot Ramos now he's apparently nothing you know Luciano is still years away like you you just it it, it feels like a point of purgatory for this Giants team and that's really frustrating because again 107 is unimpeachable I know that a lot of people with the organization are trying to backtrack it and say oh that was fluky that was fluky well, if that's if the best that we can expect from San Francisco Giants moving forward is fluky because they're going to keep doing the same thing that they do year after year. Unless they break that cycle, the best that we can expect is fluky. I don't want to ride. I, I don't want to hang out with that. That's what the Oakland A's do. Um, that's that's nonsense. And it's why the A's are you want to talk about a state of purgatory. That's where they live. Um, Moneyball is absolutely fantastic for the bottom of the roster, top of the roster, get your wallet out, get your prospects and put them on the table, play big boy baseball. And right now the giants just seem fine to be a middle market team. Last time I checked, San Francisco doesn't play with that state of California doesn't play with that. And this, just this region should not play with non-championship team. And the giants are not making any overtures at all. This is maybe why I'm not on KPR as much anymore. They're not making any overtures at all that they're actually interested in playing championship baseball. Not at all. And um, they've had multiple opportunities. Hell, every day up until that trade deadline was an opportunity for them to say, oh, yeah, no, no, no. We were just waiting in the weeds. We were just hanging out here ready to rumble. We're, we're back. We're going we're gonna to make a push here, get into that playoff spot, and we'll see what happens. They, they are not making those overtures. And we can blame anybody we want. But this is a this is an organizational issue. It, when I say San Francisco Giants, you can say, "Oh, that's Gabe Kapler's fault, or that's Farhan Zaidi's fault, or that's Charles Johnson's fault, or that's Larry Bear's fault, or that's the city of San Francisco." You can blame anybody you want. This is a San Francisco Giants issue, and so I guess all of them deserve a little bit of blame in this and divvy it out as you wish. You got to play for championships in this market. You got to play for championships when you make that kind of money. You got to play for championships when you have giants across your chest. You can you can compete for a division crown every now and again, a wild card here and then. If you know you're the A's and you have conditioned your fans to expect crappy years and mediocrity, and every now and again we'll put it all together. Uh, you know, this is this is the downside of having incredible success and building up an incredible fan base or I guess bolstering it um, with that incredible success of winning three World Series in the span of five years. Like you've got to compete for championships, especially to when you know your rivals, your two top rivals in all of baseball are out there. Playing that game without question. And who knows what happens when it's all said and done with them. But you, you got to be in the same ballpark as that. You got because right now the Giants are way closer to the Rockies and the Diamondbacks than they are to the Padres and, and the Dodgers on an overarching you know, organizational stance. That's unacceptable to me. And I have <laughs> marginal stake in the game because I haven't been paying attention to answer your question. Not that much. I put it on, watch a couple innings here and there, check the box score, watch the highlights. I mean, I, I guess I'm more engaged than most people who don't talk about them at all to me anymore. Uh, but uh yeah it's just this team this team isn't about it so why should i be about it well there you go that's a great answer and and 107 is is still a a number that really rings through the halls of oracle park and as much as probably gabe kapler doesn't like to hear it the media still brings it up and you know just it was last year Stephen. we aren't even a year separated from that incredible september they just did it and for them to have taken for them to so clearly not look like that team anymore, despite the fact that all the faces are more or less the same, that all of the sort of formulas that they used are the same for them to look nothing like 107. It's like, yeah, every day that passes, you think to yourself, boy, that was fluky. And that sucks. That sucks. That 107 is still rung out in the, you know, the, the, the concourse of Oracle park as 
uh, it's almost like a negative term now. Yeah. It's taking on a negative connotation, like 107. Remember when we all got fooled into thinking that this <laughs> team was going somewhere? What a bunch of jerks we were. That, that it, sucks, man. That sucks. It, and if you want a definition of, you know, the stars aligning, I mean, everything that went right went totally. right. Every break yeah. that could possibly have been caught was caught by the Giants. I mean, yeah. everybody, Darren Ruff, career year. Total. Wilmer Flores, career year. Lamont Wade, career year. All these guys, it all happened at the Wait, same time. Have you seen Lamont Wade? Have you seen Lamont Wade anytime recently? I haven't been paying that much attention. But Lamont Wade disappeared for months on end. I mean, this is this is the killer for me, right? And I've gotten into it a little bit on this. Like, the bottom of the roster, awesome. You know, Lamont Wade, quadruple A player. Let's just call it what it is. And he comes to the Giants and he's on fire. He's just killing it. It's fantastic. Why did we think that he was just continuously do that forever? A uh, Mike Yastrzemski, same thing. Like, he's a really good player. There's nothing wrong with Mike Yastrzemski. He should be on the San Francisco Giants. He should be playing every day. But, like, why did we think that Mike Yastrzemski, like, every other team got it wrong and the Giants now figured out the way to turn him into a perennial all-star? Like, there's a level of flukiness to all of this stuff. And, you know, you add in... You know, the Brandon Crawford, I don't actually have a problem with, you know, extending the Brandons because they were so good and they did fit what was done. And like Crawford was a legitimate MVP candidate last year. So like, you're not going to let him go. I mean, what, so you can sign Carlos Correa? Like, that's not good business. And he's honestly, it wouldn't have stopped gap to Luciano. A hundred percent. So like, I didn't have a problem with that, but like, we also had to understand, like, it's so obvious now and it's easy for me to say in hindsight, uh, but, like, I think we all knew and just didn't say it out loud. Like, well, he's not doing that again. Like, his glove mm-hmm. is still going to be awesome. He's still going to be someone you want in the lineup every day. But he's not going to be that guy again. And then, you know, with Brandon Belt, it's like, well, who the hell knows? I mean, he's more of a platoon player. And, you know, who knows with the injuries? Like, he's probably not going to do that again. And you just have a bunch of guys who then when you break it all down outside of really starting pitching, because bullpen, they're not going to do that again. Uh, when you break it all down, you're like, damn, you got a lot of guys who just like, aren't going to do what they did last year again in all likelihood. And you didn't bring in anybody who's likely going to do better or likely going to make up the difference. So this is what you get. And this is why I think a lot of people expected this team to be 92, 93 wins, like good, but not great. Kind of in the run, kind of a weird year, maybe a stop gap, whatever you want to call it, but like competitive could make a run at it. The Giants, if the Dodgers are going to win 100 games, Giants would be into it, you know, be in the division, you know, kind of race late into September. Same with the Padres, them and the Padres kind of going back and forth. But for there to be such clear tranches of like Dodgers, big pile of crap, Padres, <laughs> big pile of crap, and then Giants, that's the frustrating part. You got to be competing with the Padres. Like there's just no reason not to be. If the Dodgers are just going to lap the field, y- you take your lick. But like, you got you got to be in the same ballpark as the Padres. You got to be in the same ballpark as the Cardinals and the Brewers. I mean, the Mets, and this is what, you know, good, good on the Mets, and we'll see how it works long-term, but, like, the Mets went out and spent money. They went out mm-hmm. and, and you know, got a guy like a Mark Canna. Who, who wouldn't kill for Mark Canna on this Giants baseball team right now? And it's not like they went out and paid him $30 million a year. And so now we're in this weird, terrible cycle, I think, where because the Giants didn't do enough to actually bolster their lineup, because they didn't, uh, add from a position of strength going into this season. Now the goal seems to be with fans and I, me more so than anybody else. This is as much, uh, this is as much a criticism of myself and my coverage than, than anybody else. No other people on the, um, like not Evan, we beggar, you know, anybody like that. This is a me thing. But when I'm paratrooping in, like the problem now is it feels like a grand gesture needs to be made that the, uh, you need to go big. You need to go and do you go get no Tani, go get Mike Trout, go get somebody big, go get, um, you know, uh, uh, an Aaron judge. And it's like, no, what you really need are like four Mark Hanna's. Mm-hmm. Cause that's really the way you play baseball. And this team, you know, you put one guy in the three spot, like that's not going to change shit. It's just and, not going to. And they've already tried that route too. Team. And they've picked other, yeah. other teams, Bryce Harper. How did that go? You know, for the most part, I think that was more ownership driven. Uh, Cause you yeah. know, Farhan Zaidi taken over the team and it's kind of a team in shambles and he gets there and we're talking Bryce Harper. Like, I don't, I honestly don't think that was completely him. Um, yeah. But, but it's funny. You mentioned that um, 
the the, the Mark Hanna thing in the Mets, they also get Francisco Lindor and how yeah. you know, a lot of fans think, oh, you need a, a few stars to function properly. Uh, and, and you 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 wrote something and you <laughs> you took a lot of heat for this one as as most columnists do when they write stuff. No, it's yeah. Mike Yastrzemski, you said that he was not the price of admission, and I didn't think that was a hot take at the time, but apparently <laughs> it turned into a hot take. Well, it's a hot take for people who uh, whose day to day is tied to the San Francisco Giants. Like it, if if I had if my entire career was staked to the San Francisco Giants, I would be doing everything in my power to convince myself that that is not a bad place to be. Uh, But this is the other issue. I can bring up the Giants problems all I want. There are bigger issues at play. And legitimately, I'm not sure if a lot of this stuff is a Giants issue or an overarching baseball issue. This team is boring as hell to watch. They are boring. The only time that they do something interesting is when it's like, oh, they might blow this one where you have to get out the barf bag. Like that's when they do something interesting. That's not interesting. I'm not interested in being tortured on a nightly basis. I love baseball. I love, I I love the game when it is played at its most athletic at its most dominant. Like I want to see, you know, I'm, I try to be a decent golfer. I'm actually a crappy golfer. And my friend, Kevin Clark once said, when we were playing, he's like, dude, I'm not out here to score. I'm out here to do cool shit. And I thought that was a great perspective that would never have dawned on me. Um, what are you out here doing? You're out here entertaining, trying to have fun, do cool shit, just do cool shit at some point. And the giants never do cool shit. They don't do anything interesting and they haven't done it all season. Let me know the day when they did a bunch of cool shit because it's station to station baseball. It's three true outcomes. I don't care about three and two counts. I just want to see cool stuff happen. And this team doesn't do it. But then I flip on other games and I'm like, they're not doing that much interesting stuff. Like it's just, it's not an interesting product right now. And the giants are playing the game of the era and maybe they're overdoing it a little bit with the sort of the concept of valuations and never wanting to lose a deal and all that. But like, I don't have any interest in watching a, you know, a baseball game that doesn't involve the two teams in this market or the Chicago white Sox, my home, you know, hometown team. Like, I don't have any interest in watching Yankees and Mets. And so it's like, how good of a price be as a sport if I don't have any interest in what, like, I don't care about the baseball playoffs going into this season. Like, the White Sox will be in it. They'll lose in two games or three games. And then I'll be like, okay, fine. I'll find out what happens on YouTube. You know, like, I'll just check the highlights, like, so that I'm at least in the loop. You know, I'll read a couple of people. But, like, I'm not going to sit down and watch a four-hour World Series game between, you know, I don't care if it's the Yankees and the Dodgers. Like, I just don't care. The sport is not interesting enough for me right now. Uh, for somebody who, you know, in my heyday was spending 50 days a year at the ballpark and watching 162. Like, that was my life. And the product has gotten to the point where it's just general. I, I'm watching WNBA basketball on a weekend instead of the baseball game because that's more interesting as an entertainment product. So the Giants have this issue. I think all of baseball has this issue. And if you're trying to tell me that Mike Yastrzemski is supposed to get me to not just pay Oakland A's prices, not just pay, you know, <laughs> pay for some, but to, I, I live in Alameda. I can take the ferry in. I can drive in. It takes about 20 minutes. But to get in my car, go over the Bay Bridge, pay $30 to park, walk a mile, which is fine. You probably could use the exercise. Go into the park. If I want to have one beer and one hot dog, congratulations. That's another 30 friggin' dollars. Then I get to sit in seats. If I want to spend $30 on seats, I get to sit in seats that I have no frame of reference whatsoever to what's actually happening in the game because 65% of the game happens on the 60 feet, six inches and the little 18 inch plate. I don't get to see the ball doesn't get put in play enough. And when it does, it's obvious. Oh, just a can of corn. You know, if every if every at bat had to end and it wouldn't because that's not how the rules are structured, had to end with the ball in the field of play, that would be interesting. But I have hundreds of thousands of square feet that just aren't really used and just a bunch of guys standing around and shifting. And it's like unless I'm right behind home plate or dead center or like low and maybe off to the side a little like I'm not getting any of the game. I'm better off watching it on TV. 
And when I watch it on TV, I'm so bored that anytime a commercial break happens, which is all the time, I want to flip the channel to something. Like this is this is a, so the notion that Mike Yastrzemski is going to come out and see Shohei Otani barely gets me interested in baseball anymore. Again, I'm the compulsory market. Mike Trout barely gets me interested in baseball anymore. We got I, I, I hate to do the whole like millennial TikTok all this crap. Like, you know how many easy points of entertainment I can get on the exact same system I currently have going? Like baseball, I'm not background noising. When I'm doing that, if I want a background noise, I'll put it on the radio, which is a great product still. And I do a lot of crap with the radio on. But like, this isn't background. If I'm sitting down and watching a ball game, if I'm watching the NFL. If I'm watching the NBA, I'm sitting down. I'm engaging with the product. I actually watch. I'm not just on my phone the whole time. With baseball, almost immediately on Instagram and Twitter, and I'm just scrolling. I'm not even paying attention. What kind of a product is that? You're, you're asking me to engage for three and a half hours with something I can't engage with right now because my internet brain is so warped for more than like five minutes max. This is, this is a big issue. So I, I found the, I found the whole Mike Kostromsky thing, like totally laughable. Mike's a great guy. Uh, <laughs> like I, I, I do think that he's you know, a worthy player, but like, who are you selling to the fans of San Francisco right now? Who can I go to my wife? who doesn't give a crap about baseball, who doesn't really have that much interest in going to the game. Who can I go to my wife and convince her in a two or three minute speech? Like, Hey, we should go and see this guy. I was able to do that with Shohei Otani at the Coliseum. I was able to say, Hey, let's go see this guy. He is, you know, Japanese guy. He's going to, you know, just came over hundred miles per hour. He's going to pitch and he's going to DH in the same game. Let's go do it. We saw Otani's first start in major league baseball. It was great. We sat right behind home plate because you can get in cheap at the A's games. Who can I do that with? Who can I do that with with the San Francisco Giants? Oh, let's go see Brandon Crawford. If you've met, if, you, if this is the first time you've seen Brandon Crawford, my goodness, you missed some great stuff. Like, <laughs> exactly. Who, by the, let's go see Brandon Bell. Well, hope he's in the lineup today. Let's go see Jake Peterson. Well, you might have said that a couple weeks ago. You're definitely not saying it now. But also, like, I don't know if he's going to be in the lineup that day. Who is the star of the? They're oh, facing a on, lefty. <laughs> they're facing a lefty we can't have that guy in same thing with longoria and this is my problem with platooning like it makes sense you should logically have the best lineup on the field every day but this shows where the giants are with their roster and why they have bottom roster players locked down but they can't get the top guys i don't mind if your guy who you want to bat number two against righties has to bat seven against lefties i don't mind that that doesn't bother me but he's in the lineup He's somewhere. I'm going to see him every day. He's good enough that you have to have him in there because he hits, you know, he hits from that side of the player. He hits this arm, you know, not as well, but good enough that he's in the lineup with the giants. Everybody is expendable depending on the hand of the pitcher. That tells me that they don't have good enough players that they can't even switch and mix and match. Okay. One or two, maybe three guys, a 30 year lineup having to mix in and out. Because, hey, this guy's different. That's fine. That doesn't bother me. That's no big deal because no one's going to go see those guys. When your entire roster is those guys, that's a huge issue to me. That's a huge issue to me. And it comes back to the same question I just asked, which I've been asking time and time again. Why the hell should I go to this game? Because you can't sell me on, oh, this guy's pitching. Pitching is not going to get me to go to the ballpark because pitching is impossible to consume in a reasonable way at the ballpark. Oh, I get to cheer because it's a three, two count. Hope this guy swings and misses. Like it, it, it's fun. Like obviously pitching is important. I care about pitching, but like, Oh, five innings where I get to get, I pick up none of the minutia or the brilliance of this guy. And then we get to see four innings of relief pitchers coming in and out. Like that doesn't appeal to me. I need to, I need to feel excited and interested in a couple of the players, a couple of the players minimum in the lineup. And right now, I'm not interested or compelled by anybody in this lineup, really, except for maybe Joey Bart. And that's just because that's a morbid curiosity at this point. <laughs> He's yeah, exactly. doing some really cool stuff, but it's like, oh, boy, let's let's see how long this lasts. Exactly. Like, I, don't, I don't think Joey Bart's going to be like the number three hitter for actual contending team at any point. I think he could be a really if you're a really good team, you got Joey Bart batting seventh or eighth, like a really good team. And right now it's like he's the only guy you can convince me is is worth the price of admission and that's and sell especially when you're the price of admission is as high as it is here yeah exactly and i think that there's only going back to the platoon thing 
I think yeah. there's only so many so many players who are struggling around the league that they could bring in and say, we could fix this guy, right? Only so much, so many of them work. You know, they thought and, they could find something with Alex Cobb, who's got great movement and a guy who's a sinker baller. He no, went I to think drive line. I think, he ended I think up that, throwing I think, 95. But there's only yeah. so many guys that that works with. And that's all they're doing. Like, that's all they're doing. Again, those are bottom of the roster guys. Like, those are the guys that when you have this solid day-to-day lineup, oh, those guys are really interesting and fun and compelling, right? Because you have this base. When you're trying to sell this, this fleeting mercenary situation as the base, it's like, why the hell am I engaging in this? The Warriors, you know, it's fun when they have an Alfonso McKinney or Gary Payton II or, you know, just name your guy. Like, they can have dudes who show up for a year become cult favorites because they have the base. They have the foundation by which to sell on a day-to-day basis. Steph, Clay, Draymond, Looney, uh, now Wiggins and uh, Poole and all this. They, they ha- we know what we're getting. We know what the Warriors are. And so finding a diamond in the rough on top of that, whoa, that's as good as it gets. But when your entire team is just... <laughs> just diamonds homing, in the rough. Yeah, diamonds in the rough. And honestly, they're more like a cloudy emerald or a ruby. <laughs> like... It, <laughs> And you're like, yeah, okay, we can get by. Like, why is it that every guy in the lineup, it just feels like they're a ticking time bomb of falling apart? Like physically or just they're you know, doing the Jock Peterson this year, where it's just, it, it, it all just feels so terribly temporary in a sport that is supposed to be, have a sense of semi-permanence. Like it's 162 games. And now I'm being told by, you know, Giants defenders, well, actually we need to look at it over a two and a three year span. And it's like, dude, I am not going to compartmentalize 400 baseball games as sort of the actual season because, oh, well, you know, it was always going to even out. Luck carries over year to year. And it's like, what the hell are we talking about? Why don't we just go back to the beginning of time and just figure it out from there? Like (laughs) it just, they won 107 last year. Was it a fluke? I mean, I would say that they were probably they, they won so many games. It was hard for it's hard for me to say that they didn't deserve to win 99, 100 of them. Maybe seven of them were fluky. That's still a hundred win team. That's still a really big deal. They didn't fluke out for 20 wins. You know? And that's what they're basically saying right now. Oh, actually, 25 wins that we had last year. Totally fluky. Had no idea how we did it. Couldn't figure it out. If you can have that level of fluke, the system is broken. The system is broken. And by the way, if the system is broken, figure out a way to exploit that again, because they did it once. And and that appears to be the only model they have. It's just, it's just really frustrating because I would love, I would love so much to be able to engage with this team. But so much of what I do is having to sell a story, sell a concept, sell an idea. I can't sell the San Francisco giants without shitting all over them because it is so uneventful uninteresting and disappointing and i can only write that so many times before i'm just clearly as evidenced by this podcast just droning on and on with the same crap all day every day and you know to the point where you you, you turn me off but the problem then we get into the whole other thing of the the sycophantism and, and the nonsense with the giants and it's just like what are we doing here what are we doing here play big boy baseball Play big boy baseball. You're are you big boys or are you not? Because if you want to be the Oakland A's, congratulations. I know what your future looks like, and it's a pile of crap. There you go. No, hundred percent. And they're a big market. I don't think they could afford any any rebuild or anything. So we'll see what happens. But I want to switch gears here, and I want to <laughs> <laughs> I want to switch gears here. I want to ask you about the whole Fernando Tatis Jr. thing because I haven't talked yeah. about it with anybody on this. Yeah, um, he was popping, of course, for using PEDs. And, you know, he might fall into the category of when he's healthy, one of those young stars that you might pay to see, possibly. Um, but just it's tattoos. just another... I, I can sell tattoos. There you go. I yeah. can sell it, And he's just an, it's just another dumb off-the-field injury. Remember, he had the motorcycle totally. accident in the offseason. Um, God bless this weirdo. And, and, and they asked him, they said, you know, when did this happen? Then he said, which one? And which it's like, one? oh, this guy had multiple motorcycle accidents. He's yeah. owning up to it. Now he's suspended. So what do you make of that entire situation and the ringworm thing too? I mean, it's just wild. I loved, I loved his agent's uh, attempt to, uh, to not have that pinned on him. Oh, I got ringworm from my barber. 
Uh, prob- problem is that there uh, appeared to be a, a misgoogling of uh, reasonable explanations. So he was, uh, the ringworm medicine, right, was something that was just uh, like a couple letters off of the medicine, there, of the, uh, the testosterone booster that it he ended up taking. spelled the name of the drug um, wrong, exactly. Yeah, He's blaming exactly. the barber. So, Where's he going, Great Clips? Like, what, what's going on? <laughs> it, man, if I got ringworm from Great Clips, I would be really, yeah, no, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's all terribly implausible and it insulted all of our intelligence, but, you know, <laughs> that's that's tatis right like that's that's him he's been flash and show since day one and it makes him an interesting player i guess in all areas of life i mean i like watching him play because it's like hey this guy's got some energy some pizzazz some personality and he's going to show it on the diamond heaven forbid we actually do that um you know flip a bat why not he did something cool and but you know he's 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 awesome and we can say oh well you know He'll get better from his last of the Like, I don't get too much caught up in the PED stuff just because I, I, I find the more high ground to be uh, subterranean at this point when it comes to that. Like, we got PED users, known established PED users in the Hall of Fame. We're going to, you know, hold up Barry Bonds as some negative example, despite the fact that, you know, just like the commissioners I in there. I can't follow the, you know, Harold Baines is in the goddamn hall of fame, but I'm supposed to follow the train of thought. That means that Barry Bonds can't be in there. Um, it, all these things, it, Alex Rodriguez, Manny Ramirez, by the way, Manny Ramirez has just gotten the short end of the stick. Like he was one of the great right-handed hitters of all time. Like, I, I don't care. He was also a knucklehead, but he was a great player. Like, I don't know how Manny Ramirez just consistently gets nothing like nothing. Um, so the Tatis thing, it doesn't, bo- it doesn't bother me. I do think it's, enlightening uh it should be noted that his father is i don't know if this was ever published but it's you know well established that he uh he had some let's say spurt years right in the middle of the steroid era so you know apple never falls too far from the tree uh it's probably pretty good business he has a 340 million dollar guaranteed contract no like I'd get suspended for all of that. That's no work, all money. Yeah. <laughs> like I think he's I think he's in pretty good shape there. Um, maybe that's the danger of you know doing those thirteen year contracts with young guys. Um, you know, you're, you're trying to over uh, override the market a, a little bit, but you know, then you're stuck with some guys for thirteen years, and some guys uh, maybe aren't built to lose that hunger that early in their career. I, I can't speak to it. I do think that you know, it's probably a pretty good, pretty good move to have gotten Juan Soto given that Tatis uh, is out. Uh, I would have loved to have seen them as a baseball fan would have loved to have seen that full compliment going on in San Diego. And I really appreciate the Padres going for it. I appreciate the Padres doing what maybe like two other teams in baseball seem to be doing right now, which is absolutely pushing some chips into the middle of the table and saying, we would like, to win baseball games now uh what a concept what an idea uh and everybody else is like well that's going to cost like money like that's ridiculous and prospects and it's like yeah but heaven forbid you know this is i guess it's a buyer's market and i appreciate the the padres actually being buyers because too few teams are doing that right now and i keep looking over (laughs) literally looking across the bay at the the stadium right now anytime these boys want to get in on the action that'd be great uh because even with tatis out the entire year the padres are going to finish higher than the giants in the standings and what the hell happens next year when tatis is back he's got a whole bunch to prove he's probably going to be on a new cycle of something uh you got stoto in there you got you got a you got this great lineup they went out and they did the trade that i wanted getting brandon drury i know brandon drury doesn't you know sell tickets or anything he probably uh wouldn't get me to the ballpark more than once or twice but like brandon jury would have been a great fit for the san francisco giants luis castillo would have been a great fit for the san francisco giants like go out there and tell me that you're at least you know alive that you're doing something um you know sometimes the best way to know that you're alive is to do something kind of dumb uh fernando tatis knows this as well as anybody with his motorcycle accidents so uh i don't know man i just (laughs) he's a knucklehead i don't I, I, I don't lionize these guys and uh, for him to be sort of held up as, oh, well, this is bad for baseball or something. It's like dude, baseball's problems are way bigger than this. He was out of sight, out of mind, and he pushed it to a new level with, with this dumb move, but pretty telling man that the Padres keep pushing in the middle of the table, keep pushing those chips forward. 
they're going to get rewarded this year. We'll see what happens in the playoffs, but they're going to get rewarded because they're going to be in the playoffs and the Giants will not be. And, uh, you know, I know they're selling tickets like crazy. They got a great energy to that team right now. The Tatis thing brings it down a little bit, but they still have a really good energy to them. Uh, that market is huge. Uh, it's a baseball it's city now. Yeah. So 100% of baseball city. Um, one of the reasons that they feel compelled to keep pushing forward is because they feel like they have a, a, a large, like literally Mexican fan base that that Tijuana market provides them a lot of value as well uh, for people crossing the border, coming over for games. Uh, that's, that's, you know, if you know anything about Mexican baseball, of which I know very little, but I do know enough to know that Tijuana is apparently like a bitch in situation. Like it's a really cool town to go see a baseball game in in the mexican baseball league which seems to be kind of a slightly on the rise but yeah man i don't know like it, it, it how do i how do i say it didn't surprise me without sounding like a know-it-all like it just it, nothing that dude does is shocking me with tatis the motorcycle thing was honestly a bigger deal than, <laughs> than this thing yeah i guess uh, that's fair that, that's yeah. that's pretty fair i mean what'd, I looked what'd, at you, my what'd you think of it yeah what like i know you were stunned I, I imagine you like all everybody else was stunned but like i don't know did it did it hit you in some sort of way did it make you feel like what was what was your emotional state once it sort of washed over you well my first thought was okay wow i mean this is yeah. i don't know if i was shocked either but i i was thinking about their success that they've had this year without them and yeah. I was thinking about, you know, the, the players in that clubhouse who, you know, maybe the Padres are a few steps behind the Dodgers, of course, talent wise. Um, mm -hmm. But Tatis was supposed to be that guy. Oh, let's we're going to get Tatis back. We're going to get Tatis back. We mm -hmm. heard that throughout the entire season with the Padres. And now here's this jolt right. that you're not going to get Tatis back. Uh, and, yeah. and then it made me wonder, you know, this Juan Soto move was something did the, did the team know, you know, because I know sometimes the players know, sometimes the, the league office knows. So uh, yeah. a ton of things started running through my mind. Um, but I, I, I think they I think they knew. I think they knew. And I think the Soto thing was to. Uh, the question is, do they tell Soto when they trade? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. that's, that's my bigger question, because, you know, A.J. Preller was like, you know, they had to do the appeal and stuff already. And he was on his so, rehab assignment when it was happening. Tatis was rehabbing his injury and it, it was just a straight. And I, it, another thing I thought of was Melky Cabrera back in 2012, Melky Cabrera was mm -hmm. given the MVP at the all-star game by Bud Selig and Bud Selig gave him the trophy knowing that he had just looked at the results of the latest drug test from around the league, knowing that Cabrera was one of the ones that he was going to suspend in just a few weeks. So I find that <laughs> my great. Yeah. That's that's uh that's one of the great examples of never attribute to malice what can be explained by stupidity. It's uh, Hanlon's razor, <laughs> and I talk I talk to a lot of people because I'm in a lot of MBA circles, and you know people know kind of you know, people I meet them for the first time and they're like oh you know you're the Warriors guy this and that, and they go man that, it's so rigged, and you know they're just using the Tim Donaghy example from you know whenever ago, and I'm like dude if you knew the level of slap dickery that happened in professional sports on a day in day out basis, the notion of it being rigged would be so far and beyond the possibility. No yeah. Like Bud Selig, if he was smart, if he had his act together in that situation, he's like, Hey, I got an idea. How about we don't make Melky Cabrera the MVP of the game <laughs> and we'll take the heat for it for a minute, but we won't take it for a decade or two, you know? Like, let's make sure, you know, kind of what David Stern did with uh, with Magic Johnson in the 1980 NBA Finals. Like, was it Kareem's? Yeah, but we're going to make it Magic because this is better for the league. Like, that's smart. That was rigged. That guy was sharp. Bud Selig, most of the people in professional sports, oh, boy. I mean, it's not to say I'm any smarter at all. Uh, there, there's a lot of very smart people, but let's keep it all relative uh, in, in terms of sort of doing logical, sane things. Uh, we deal with this all the time in the NFL. Everyone's like, oh, it would make so much sense for Seattle to go get Jimmy Garoppolo. It's like, yeah, it makes sense. Tell me the last time any of this made sense. Stuff doesn't have to make sense. There's a lot of the logical actors out there and uh, a lot of people who love the, the smell of their own supply and ulterior motives and all that. So, you know, Fernando Tatis Jr. taking steroids, he probably did something stupid. I mean, I mean I, I'm not going to attribute to him being like, oh, I got I to gotta bulk up. I got to do this or that. Maybe he did. I'm not saying he didn't. All I'm saying is he probably just did something stupid.
<laughs> yeah. So yeah. we move on. Uh, you know, that's more likely to me. Be oh, he's got a nice track record of doing stupid stuff. Yeah. And I hate to go back to to Bud Selig and, and bring his name yeah. up again. But, no, no, no. It's all good. Uh, um, he. I actually just read his his book, and you know, I know a lot of people are like, "Why would you read that? Why would you give him the time of the day?" And it was exactly what I expected. You know, obviously, I want to see what <laughs> what craziness is in that book, and yeah. I thought it was hilarious. I opened the book, and chapter one was literally the first page. I'll have to send you a picture of the first page. It's <laughs> it's him describing his sadness when Barry Bonds was about to break Hank Aaron's record. He starts off his book defending himself with the stare. Obviously, the biggest patch of um, horribleness yeah. during his tenure as commissioner. The, the biggest thing that people, you know, the biggest issue that people pin on him, <laughs> he's defending right off the bat. So I thought, I thought that was extremely ironic too. So every now and again for fun, I'll go on like Obviously, we, we all do this. We go on baseball reference and just look at Bonds' stats. But, like, I'll also just, like, go into, like, some of those seasons that were just, like, roided to bejesus and look at, like, the WRC+, plus, which is all weighted against league average. Like 230 or something? <laughs> no, no, no. That's the killer. You're, like, you look at that. You look at some of the numbers in, like, 2002 or, you know, or whatever, and you're, like, oh, my God. This dude would be, like, a god in today's game. And then you look at it and it's like WRC plus of like 112 because everybody was a God. They were all just out of control. The pitchers were roided up. The batters were roided up. Some dude hit like, I can't even remember who it was. Some dude just hit like 50 home runs with 137 RBIs. And they're like, yeah, that was 12% better than the league average. It's like, oh my God, what, what was this sport? Maybe that's all I'm craving for. Cause that was obviously during my, uh, my formative years. Right. And uh, kind of the, the heavy, like I'm in on this game years. Uh, maybe I just need just roided players again. Maybe we need, cause the juice ball was different than the roided players. It didn't, it didn't feel the same when the ball was juiced, the juiced ball didn't have as much of an oomph to it. It didn't feel as powerful. It didn't feel as compelling. Like you get, you know, Juan Gonzalez up there, just absolutely tattooing the bejesus out of a baseball to the point where it looks like smoke is coming off his bat. Like that looks cooler. That sounds cooler. Uh, that's more compelling to me uh, than, you know, just a kind of basically playing with a super ball like they were for and a the couple physical of years element of like looking at the player looks better. Like it's like, this guy is huge. And, and does, it's funny because Jose like Canseco, Jose Canseco, yeah. like he's the, the, obviously the number one guy, he ended up being right about everything, everybody. Yeah. He ended up being, yeah. he wrote a book. He called out everybody and every, oh, this is, I remember, you know, you can't credit this. It's juiced. It was, you know, you can't credit this. He's like 30%, 80% of the league is doing this. And then everybody's yeah. like, ah, Canseco, this uneducated fool. He's an idiot, you know, getting arrested <laughs> for speeding on the highway. And then yeah. years later, McGuire comes out, admits he does it. This person yeah. admits he does it. I mean, every, this person comes up in the Mitchell report. Everybody, uh, <laughs> Jose Canseco names. You saw the, I saw the list the other day. I, I, I was asking around and someone sent me like the leaked Mitchell report list, which I had seen before, but I'm like, I, I seem to remember like this thing. And they're like, Oh yeah, I remember that. Let me send it to you. I guess they just had it like on their iCloud or something. It was like five pages long. <laughs> it was every player. It was every player. Most of them sucked. And it's mm -hmm. like, <laughs> it's like, dude, I, it's not good. That's not good for the sport. Don't get me wrong. It's not good that you have to do, you know, performance enhancing drugs that uh, clearly uh, per enhance your performance, but also, you know, have extremely serious negative side effects. Like there's no, you know, I'm not advocating for PEDs, uh, despite what I just said about a moment ago, uh, because it is, it is dangerous and it should not feel, it should not be a requisite. You need to have a level playing field. Uh, where you just have guys like Aaron Judge, who are just super freakazoids to begin with, um, doing what roided players do. But my God, uh, <laughs> it was fun. It was an absolute blast watching those guys play. And, you know, the nice part about it too was, hey, this guy who could hit 60 home runs this year is coming to town. You knew he was going to be in the lineup. Like that, that, like you can't even say that in this day and age. I'm, I'm in a pretty competitive fantasy baseball league. And it's like, how is it that like the 14th best player in this league, I can't guarantee is going to play every day. Like <laughs> That sucks. That sucks. If you're the Tampa Bay Rays, that's cool. Like you got to do something. You got to figure out a way. The San Francisco giants. It's just, just small time. Yeah. A hundred percent. No, this steroid era. I wish I could have 
I wish I could have lived. I was born in 2002, but I, I still consider myself oh, kind of a kind of a, a baseball oh, historian of some sort. Um, I, I, I like I knew that deep down, but I refuse to acknowledge it. Oh my god! Uh, so you will be. Oh, I'll be 21 goodness. in April. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're doing great for 20. Oh my god, good job. <laughs> but uh. Uh, oh my God, that's, that's not good. I think this is, yeah, again, I, deep down I knew, but like, I remember 2005 White Sox. That was a big year for me. I was. Why does oh, nobody shit. talk about that though? Like you never see any of the footage anywhere. Was it just like a really boring world series? What happened? Like it, it, nobody looks at it. Not for, not for me. Um, it was, uh, yeah, no, it was, they weren't, uh, they weren't traditionally dominant and uh, they, they didn't have great storylines other than Ozzy Guillen. Like they just, they, they were, it was just their year. The coolest thing about the 2005 White Sox was that they lost one playoff game uh, to the Red Sox in the first round. The only playoff game they lost, which was insane. Uh, they had four, they had just, their starting pitching was incredible. Burley, uh, Jose Contreras, Freddie Garcia, and John Garland. And they were just mowing dudes down, mowing them down. They barely used the bullpen in the playoffs, which was incredible. They were just going nine innings, eight innings, nine innings every night. Uh, Frank Thomas was the biggest name on that team. He wasn't on that team. They had Carl Everett batting third in the middle of the lineup. Aaron Rowand. They had Jose uh, or Juan Uribe, who was my favorite player growing up. Joe Creedy. Tadahito Aguchi. I mean, just it wasn't exactly a, a murderer's row of big names, but they were everyday guys. Paul Canerco. Paul Canerco. Paul Canerco. Paul Canerco. Hall of Very Good. I would never make an argument that Paul Canerco should be in the Hall of Fame. AJ very good. <laughs> I, I didn't bring him up on purpose. And so uh they were they were just this consistent winning machine to the point where they made winning kind of boring. They didn't lose a series all year. It's one of my favorite. It's one of my favorite things ever, and I use it as the 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 mark of any good team. How many series did you win or lose? Because everyone goes, "Oh, they won 107." Okay, how many how many series did they lose? That was the cool part about the Giants last year. Mm -hmm. Like every time, it felt like, "Oh boy, they might lose this series," and then things start to unravel. They like dug down deep and pulled something out. I think about the series, the four game set they had in Washington last year, and they had no bats. Nobody showed up and the pitching in the bullpen are just like, we are going to will a win here. We are just not going to give up a single stinking run and you will manufacture a run. If it is in the 10th inning, you will manufacture a run. Mm -hmm. No one scores. And there was this sort of collectiveness, this idea. And because they broke down this big macro concept into these smaller things, or maybe that was just me doing it, but it seemed as if they were, sorry. It seems as if they were convinced that it was series by series, it got, it, it, it was very compelling. And the White Sox, they got into a couple of jams. I remember one in San Diego early in the season, but typically they just win the first two games of the series, lose the, lose the third one and move on to the next town. They won 99 games that season. So it didn't feel like it was this, you know, incredibly great season. But if you watched it day by day, as I did, you're like, oh my God, what a team. Because anytime they needed to come through with the win on a Sunday or on a Wednesday afternoon, they would just jam one out. They would just find a way to win. Even if the starting pitching, start, like bullpen blows up, they would always find a way to win. And so they had this sort of connective tissue, the scar tissue even, of, um, of winning. And as soon as the Giants started dropping series, and not just dropping, just getting like swept, it's like they don't have it. This is a team that just doesn't have it because there's some level of pride that is involved in all all collected all collections right whether that's you know uh, uh, everybody on staff sports staff of the mercury news or just the niners people or whatever like any uh, you, college group projects that you got going on like there is a, a collective sense of pride and if you don't feel that scrap if you don't feel like hey we're up against it we gotta come together even if we're just half assing it like we but we gotta have a little bit of pride here we gotta stand up for ourselves we gotta pull this one out I just didn't feel that from the Giants from the get-go this season. I was hoping it would develop. And I just I just still just don't feel it. Like they just don't 
have that scrap. And so much of baseball, I mean, what's the old saying? 54, 54, 54. You win 54, you lose 54. It's what you do in the other 54. And I think the Giants have played a lot of those other 54 games where it could go either way. And there's just no scrap to them. I think they already have a losing record in those 54. And so now it's just about running out the clock on the 54 they're going to win and the 54 they're going to lose because they've been in a bunch of tight games and I don't trust them and they don't trust themselves. And that's, that's everything in baseball. That that's the difference between being average or good. And they're getting beat up. I think at one point in June or July, they were 500 or below against teams under 500. And those are the teams that they beat last year. So, I mean, that's right. So, I mean, what did they do against the Rockies? They I mean, they, they made the Arizona Diamondbacks look like a triple A team. Last year. I think they won they like 17 games or 16 or 17 games. It was like an all time mark yeah. in the franchise's history against the Diamondbacks. And now and, the and Diamondbacks, the, Logan Webb was like, yeah, the Diamondbacks could be the next big thing in the NOS. It's like, oh, crap, there's another one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, uh, I appreciate it because I actually kind of like the Diamondbacks lineup. And like I watch the Diamondbacks a little bit just because, you know, late night baseball sitting on the porch having a beer. And you're like, well, what's on? Well, I guess the Diamondbacks are on. Um, and so uh, <laughs> and so I watch, you know, I got to get some Dalton Var show in my life, but uh, <laughs> some Christian Walker. But it's like, dude. I, I this is this is my frustration where I, I mentioned this about well I'd say four or five weeks ago so I think they've lost a series to the Diamondbacks since I mentioned this to somebody and I'm like yeah last year they just were whooping up on the Rockies and the Diamondbacks man they just they made their hay they cleaned up and that was probably the the difference at margin and their argument was like yeah well that was never gonna last like that was that was the fluke and it's like the revisionist history I have heard from some people and it's a very small small group. But like the revisionist history I hear from some people who are just adamant that this team can do no wrong is just ridiculous. It's just ridiculous to me. Like you, we can't, if we can't acknowledge there's a problem, how the hell is it going to get fixed? And it's not that big of a problem. Like they don't suck. They're just boring. Like <laughs> and they, the best they need part was that t- Gabe Kapler said something before a series in Chase Field in Arizona. And he said, uh, I think they had just lost the series against the Dodgers or something. I, I don't know yeah. what happened. And he said something like, <laughs> yeah, we're going to get it right in Arizona. And like that didn't sit well with the Diamondbacks. And here they are, a pregame interview. <laughs> and I think I forget who it was. It might have been uh, Josh Rojas of the Diamondbacks. He was like, yeah, we heard that. Yeah. We don't like that. And I think they got like swept in two games. The Giants got swept in two or three games at Chase Field. And it's That's just this... like... and, and Logan <laughs> Webb, I, I, I was covering that game. And Logan Webb after yeah. the game said, you know, the diamond this is like the third time they've given me fits they have great players yeah, over there and it's like do. and then you look and the diamondbacks have like the third best third lowest chase rate and the other two are the giants and the dodgers it's yeah. like oh my goodness arizona is going to be that other team <laughs> you can get away with the third lowest yeah it, it's it, that's the other thing too man and i actually want your opinion on this because you know you're younger you're coming in you haven't seen as many iterations of the game as as i have like, I'm so tired of three and two counts. Like, I just don't care about them anymore. Like, it, it's, I hate, I hate this model. I hate this model of it. Like, I, I love the numbers. I, I'm all about the numbers. Don't get me wrong. But like, I'm so sick of three and two counts. Go up there with the intent of doing something. Because right now, it just seems like everybody on in this lineup, and I know it's an organizational ethos. Everybody in this lineup goes up with the intention of seeing a lot of pitches, not actually doing damage to the baseball. When was the last time you heard Gabe Kapler say do damage? He said that ad nauseum last year. And now it's like, just get a bunch of pitches in, I guess. That sucks. That's, yeah. I, no one wants to watch that crap. I think the biggest issue, and I played, I played four years. I played baseball all growing up and four years in high school. Yeah. And I, yeah. and we were always told that, you know, you got to protect with two strikes. That was, and I, I don't want to come off as get off my lawn. I'm the opposite. Like you, I like the numbers too. <laughs> you but... were born in 2002. You don't have a lawn yet. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I have a, uh, I have like a swimming, I have, swimming pool I or have something. the lawn. Yeah, no, no. Yeah. The, it's a community park for you. You're, yeah. Trust me. You're not coming across that way. I'm still going sure. down the slide and I'm still taking some time, you know, hovering on the swing set. So <laughs> yeah. um, get, get, get out of my fort. Um, no, <laughs> exactly. No, but like, you know, say your piece, say your piece. You, yeah. and, good and you, like st- striking out is, is, you know, I don't understand how it's acceptable, especially with guys in scoring position. You know, you got second and third, mm-hmm. nobody mm-hmm. out. 
and a guy has a three, two count and he's looking at a pitch and I don't care what the box says. Cause frankly, the box on TV is such a misdirection for fans because it's, they need to get rid of it that you have to understand the angle at a ballpark is where those cameras are. It's not always completely straight. Usually it's a little bit angled to the right or left. And it's, it's the K zone is the worst thing to happen to TV telecasts or at least one of them. So, you know, and if, if it's a pitch just off the plate in a way and yeah, maybe it's not a strike, but what were you told in little league swing at anything close so if yeah. it's a, if it's a half inch off the plate and it's you know mathematically a ball swing yeah. you know and 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 these hitters are taught to and you know some hitters before were guest hitters and that's how it usually get worked that. but now they're going up and they're thinking about one specific pitch okay I'm gonna get a I'm gonna get a fastball middle in okay and if they don't get it they don't swing yeah. that's literally yeah. the philosophy not just that they're doing that's what they're being taught. From from the minute they're drafted in the pro baseball, that's what they're taught is if you don't get a pitch that you don't like, don't swing, lay off of it. And it, it like yeah. if you can't drive the ball, if you can't do damage, like you mentioned, the damage part of it, don't swing. Mm-hmm. And that's I yeah. mean, we're seeing in the shift. And, I, you know, I, I could go either way with the shift. I could be persuaded either way. I'm kind of glad it's going away for a Same. few reasons number one we get to see second basemans again we don't get to see what a concept wilmer, Flo- is wilmer flores <laughs> is it max muncie at second base uh, uh, is uh, at second base. we get to see yeah. them dive again instead of just stand in right field they get to dive yeah. theater they get to yeah. dive for baseballs again we don't well, you know but, it's it's an unbelievable advantage having guys set up exactly where they should be in a ball here it's satisfying in a sense but I want to see Brandon Crawford move again instead of being stationed right behind second. And the other totally. reason is, is because the hitter so many, you know, these left-handed hitters and Ryan Howard's career died because of it. And, you know, he had injuries too, but I always think of Ryan Howard getting robbed because of the shift, but you hit a bullet to the right side and you're frustrated, but, and it's easier said than done when people say, Oh, hit the ball the other way. Like, yeah, you go and try that against a 97 guys, these... mile an hour sinker, you know, on the outer half of the me. plate. It's easier. So these guys have to go up. These guys have to go up and they can only think about one pitch in one spot, but they're supposed to just put anything anywhere. Like, so which is it like, and this is, this is maybe the existential question with baseball. Do we need to make it so that hitters have more ability? Because do we need to lower the mound, which I think would be the most applicable manner in which to, to neutralize. Do we need to neutralize pitchers to the point where hitters have a better chance of doing something with the ball? Or do hitters just need to buckle the hell up and stop complaining about, oh, I can't, I can't do what I want with the baseball. Like they need it. You need to be able to hit in all directions. Like I do think that that's, you know, most of the time you see an opposite field hit, it, it's almost accidental unless it's like 15 mm-hmm. guys in baseball. You're like, oh, that worked out for me. I beat the shift. It's like, yeah. you didn't beat crap. You were late on a fastball. Uh, <laughs> and so like, <sighs> I, that's the frustrating part to me. It's like, oh, well, how are they supposed to do anything with these pitches? Well, then we can't hold them to that standard of hit it to where they're not. But if we want to hold them to the standard, hit where I, I don't know where the coefficient is on that, but it just speaks to like the power on power. It isn't fun. And I use this analogy a lot. Like I just have golf channel on all the time. And uh, it's a terrible channel, by the way. Uh, I don't learn anything, but I'll, I'll, I'll see some like European tour stuff or some like, you know, LPGA tour stuff. And they actually like hit golf shots. Like they have like to do creative things and shape the ball. And American, American golf is like just hit the living Jesus out of it and figure it out on the back end. And that's what baseball is. And it's just not as interesting. And like, hitters have stopped tough. trying to hit the ball into the shift, by the way. That's why we're seeing more of the launch angle is because instead of trying to hit the ball through yeah, the shift, over it. they're trying to hit the ball over the shift. And they're not going to bunt because, you know, if you bunt, you know, th- there's, oh, you know, that, first yeah, of all, they don't know how. The other day. Yeah, first yeah. Thing, that was, I was covered. That was the game that I was at. But it, first of all, if you bunt, you know, none of them could bunt. So that's, that's problem number one. Second of all, yeah. it, you know, a single is, is, is not, that's why we're seeing guys like, no players like Tony Gwynn or Wade Boggs or Ichiro yeah. or any of those. Guys. And I get Because the I single get doesn't carry any value to your OPS. Um, because everybody's yeah, looking I, for extra bases and stuff, extra base hits and stuff. So that's why bunting is not appealing. So in a me. sense, you have to hit the ball yeah. over the fence. Well, here's a concept. 
maybe a single would matter more if dudes actually tried to steal bases. Maybe, you know, doubles should be, uh, maybe we should drop this OPS thing. Like, I, I know it's all about sort of the macro game and the runs created, but like you have an entertainment product too. And the entertainment product right now suffers because you're only getting people to come for a day. You know, you're only getting people to show up for one game. And it's like, well, it's all about the long run or apparently multiple season runs. It's like, dude, that's not interesting. I get to see a little split, uh, a little blip of what actually matters. Uh, Steal more bases, do do more stuff, make things more interesting. These are supposed to be great athletes. I don't see anyone doing anything athletic ever in baseball, mm-hmm. it seems like. And I don't like batting average. Standing around. Yeah, and I don't like batting yeah. average. I barely use it. You know, I, I, I agree that it doesn't show I'm the whole you. story of production. However, this is still the era of ballplayers that are coming up that look at batting average. And they these people used to judge it. Like, for example... Yeah. If you know you're a 25 year old playing in the big leagues right now, you grew up watching TV. You bro, you grew up watching games on TV and seeing a guy hitting 300 and saying, "Wow, that's amazing." But that's when you're a good at, player, yeah, when you're at the plate in the big leagues and you look up at the scoreboard during your at bat and you see 180 and you're pleased with that, like how how in the world, like who poisoned you? Who like hypnotized you? And the a thinking, walk is, is not good. as good as a hit. A walk <laughs> is not as good as a hit, even though you might get to first base either way. Because a walk is way less interesting than a and hit. Especially with runners on the, base. You know, a, run, a, a base hit with a runner on base, a run on second base that could score a run. If you're walking, Make something you know, happen. Yeah, if you're walking, you set up a Ugh. double play opportunity for the next and I don't know. It's all it's all over the place. Sorry. <laughs> it's not good though that you're born in two thousand two and you're like get off my lawn. Like that's where <laughs> we're at with the game. Yeah. This is the game that you've known. You've lived entirely in the money ball era. And mm-hmm. it's obviously ex- accentuated to the point where now teams are doing money ball with money or in the case of the San Francisco giants hoarding the money. Uh, and it's like, dude, that sucks because I remember stealing bases and doing interesting things and guys maybe just not being good enough to not do interesting things. But now we're at this point where it's all just very rote and unathletic. And it's like, why would I, it's like barely a sport. And here's one thing that I these other say. games. That form of baseball is still being played somewhere. Somewhere it's still ju- junior college Has baseball. I've covered junior college yeah. baseball. It's still happening there. It's still happening at some college programs. Cause you know what? Those awesome. guys from that era are still in charge at those levels. Yeah. But you know what? I'm sure it's a pretty fun game to watch. What a concept. Yeah. hundred percent. Little league. You watch the little league world series. There's still kids stealing bases. <laughs> they have to wait till I, the I ball crosses the plate, but they're still going, you know? Yeah. yeah. Maybe, <laughs> maybe that's not the rule we should put in for base. I got like 2% battery left. So what else do we want to talk about? No, that's it. That's it, man. I appreciate you All coming right, on man. the show. Uh, I mean, we, we hit a lot of topics there and uh, awesome. some enthusiasm. So I appreciate you coming on. I've had a lot of things on my chest as of late. And I appreciate you letting me get them off. Yeah. It's always anytime a pleasure, you want to vent, just, call me up and then we'll 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 come have you on and we'll do another therapy session so i'll I'll tell i'll tell you uh i'm gonna make a joke that makes me seem a lot older you don't know about any time minutes that was a thing we had to do back in the day i was i was gonna make a joke about taking up all your phone minutes that i make to other like 30 something year olds but you've lived in an era where minutes aren't a thing at all you've had a lot text your entire life do i need duolingo to figure that out (laughs) what yeah thank you thank you you do you do it's for 2002 lingo uh it's, go ask my Jesus mom what that Christ. means <laughs> go ask your go ask your mom i'm with that she'll this is less of a generational divide between me and your mom oh my god <laughs> steven it's an absolute pleasure you're doing great stuff keep it up man thank you so much all right dieter kurdbach you guys can follow him on twitter at dieter uh go check him out he's got great stuff uh and of course follow the podcast on twitter and instagram at rizzocast and then go check it out spotify youtube apple podcast uh wherever you find your podcast More stuff coming up. See you next time.